Sage's Stories. Welcome to today's episode of Sage's Stories, the official podcast of Sage's, the Society of American Gastrointestinal and Endoscopic Surgeons. Please make sure to hit the like button and subscribe so you can stay up to date with our most recent episode and enjoy the show. Well, I hope everyone's enjoyed their 2023 summer. I don't know. We're either closing out a summer or kicking off the fall with episode 19 of Sage's Stories, where we shine the light on some of Sage's most impactful leaders. I am your co-host, Dr. Sharin Tofai from Los Angeles, California. And coming to you from Cleveland, Ohio, I'm Dr. Kevin L. Hayek. How was your summer, Kevin? It's pretty good. It's the uh, first summer in a couple of years where I wasn't studying. So mm. it's, uh, it's great to be finally done with school, I think, after 40 This is elementary? Years. Elementary school? <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> yeah. It's a weird feeling. Uh, no, more know, I, <laughs> no more coloring books. No more coloring books. I still, But I do still have that recurring dream where... I'm about to take a final in a class I've never attended. Mm. Did you, do you ever have that dream? Oh my God, all the time. I usually, I'm either late for a class or I forgot to study for like an exam or something and I show up. Nice. And believe you not, last night, I literally dreamed that I showed up. <laughs> I had to give a talk and I didn't even know that I was a keynote speaker and I show up having no talk. Oh my God. And then of course you just wake up and you know. Well, I'm, it's good to hear that I'm not the only one with the same recurring dreams or nightmares, if you will. I've had no Sage's stories, weird dreams, though. They've always kind of, uh, I don't know, I think we haven't really missed an episode yet. No. I, I think it's all because you're such a diligent co-host, Kevin. I really want to thank, thank you publicly. Well, and you always- I do appreciate you. And you always keep me on task and you always keep things light. So I love that. Well, talking about doing this podcast without glitches, it's really our pleasure to be able to snag our next guest, Dr. K. Marie King, on our show. We are so fortunate to have her. She will hopefully take us um, take some time out of this podcast to explain what a whirlwind of a year or two she has had. So on that note, welcome to Sages, K. Marie. K. Marie. Thank you guys for having me and for inviting me. I'm in such good company and I hope I live up to the expectation. I mean, you've already met my expectations because your office is beautiful. <laughs> for those you. of you in the podcast, you can't see, but she has the most gorgeous. It's very elegant. Yes. She wins the award. For, I mean, okay. If any of you know K. Marie King, she is definitely the most stylish person you'll see at the meeting. Sure. I'm serious. You can, I mean, like, but Sharon had a close fashionable. second, though. Sharon's a close <laughs> second, I will say. That's why I notice these things. These are, I, I, have I know, because you're paying attention. Exactly. Paying attention. Most There's of no competition. Most folks pay attention to my shoes. And as I age, yes. they're getting flatter and flatter. Oh, yes. <laughs> I'm already there. <laughs> but there's some really nice flats out there. Oh, I have some fantastic flats there. Yeah. Literally, I get so many compliments on my flats. Okay, this year I'm going to br bring out my flats and we'll share. Nice. Yeah. We'll have a we're going to have a flats off in the flats <laughs> of Cleveland. We have a we have a flats in Cleveland which, which is where we're going to be for stages in 2024. So, you guys bring your flats to the flats. That's right. All right. For those of you who, who don't know, by way of introduction, Dr. King is currently the Henry and Sally Schaefer Chair of the Department of Surgery at Albany Medical College in New York and the Chief of Surgery at Albany Medical Center Hospital in Albany, New York. She is a graduate of St. Joseph's College in Brooklyn, New York, after which she received her medical degree from Washington University in St. Louis, Missouri. Dr. King completed her general surgery residency at the University of Pittsburgh and did a fellowship of GI uh, at the GI Surgical Scholar Fellowship Program and was a Mayo Clinical College of Medicine fellow in GI surgery, which includes hepatobiliary and pancreas surgery at the Mayo Clinic in Rochester, Minnesota. During her educational journey, she also completed a Master of Science Biomedical Sciences at Mayo Clinic College of Medicine and a Master's of Business Administration at Brian, excuse me, at Brandeis University. 
Kevin, you're you've got a lot of competition here too. I know, I know. <laughs> She's got two more letters than I do. I, I might have to go back after all. <laughs> keeps saying, are you going to do a law degree next? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> Listen, don't give him any more ideas. His wife may need him. I know, seriously. <laughs> Dr. King uh, has been an active leader and friend to many in Sages, including us and numerous other surgical societies. She is also, check us out, United States Army veteran, having served in Operation Desert Storm. Thank you for your service. Thank you. And we cannot wait for you to share your story. This is, I mean, we may need more than the typical hour. This is amazing. Yeah. We'll it depends it... on what you're asking. <laughs> <laughs> I think we'll keep you going. I think we'll keep you going. That's great. So as you may know, unlike other medical podcasts, Sage's stories doesn't focus solely on clinical topics. We'll, we'll certainly pepper those in, but the topic is the guest. Uh, and so there are no wrong answers. What we, what we really aim to do is get to know the person behind the legend that so many know you to be. Uh, to start, we'd like to hear a little bit about your early years growing up. But before we get to that, I am a huge fan of unique names, and K. Marie definitely fits that description. I can't say that I know another K. Marie out there, so it's always great to know the story behind the name. So if you wouldn't mind sharing that, that'd be a that's great a, starting that's point. A good story. So my great grandmother's name was Kizaya Kachura. And they called her Sake, which is Sister K in Jamaica for short. And my mom, there was a, 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 a radio host in Jamaica called Marie Garth, and she loved that name. So K Marie comes from my grandmother and Marie Garth. That's awesome. Oh, so I knew there was a story. Yeah. I, I could have been story. Kizaya or Kizaya. <laughs> <laughs> which would which would also be the only one that I would know as well. Me so. too. <laughs> Kevin just likes it because it starts with a K. I do like that. I do like the K. I'm I'm a fan of the K. Yeah, for sure. And actually, my funny story. My daughter's name is Kira Marie. So oh, really, technically, K Marie. Well, we should so yeah. call her K Marie now. We could. That's we could right. absolutely. She could be the it's second K Marie. Yeah. So. And, and my family, most of the women, their middle name is Marie. So it's like oh, a yeah. family thing also. Are you Catholic? I'm not. It's oh. surprising. We grew yeah. up Methodist. Um, but yeah, it's surprising so many Maries. And do your siblings also have unique names or, or like a kind of combination names? Or No, my siblings are pretty straightforward. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Nadine and Donald. Okay. <laughs> All right. Yes. So uh, where do you fit in that? Uh, among I'm, the, I'm the first child. Of course I'm you the are. the first child in my, in, from my mom and my, the last child from my dad. Nice. Right. And uh, maybe tell us a little bit about your early years. Where'd you grow up? What was impactful yeah. for you in your journey to eventually become a physician? Yes, I grew up in, I was born in Jamaica, the island, not Jamaica, Queens, and uh, grew up after immigrating to the U.S. with my family in Brooklyn, New York. I interviewed someone who is from Brooklyn. I said, wait, what? I mean, the new Brooklyn or the old Brooklyn? Uh, I grew up in, 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 um, in um, Flatbush, East Flatbush, where all the Caribbeans were and went to school at St. Joe's, which was downtown Brooklyn. Um, but yeah, that's my story. When did you come over? What age were you when you- I was a, I was a preteen. And pre culturally, I was really still embedded in the Jamaican culture, Jamaican church, Jamaican restaurants, mm -hmm. Jamaican clubs. And when I went to Wash U in St. Louis, it was like culture shock. <laughs> It's like, yeah. German oh, yeah. chocolate cake, what's that? Like, <laughs> I had to learn a different culture and, and learn. That's when I lost my accent. I had to learn to speak with my Americanized accent. It was a time. Do you, do, do does you... your accent come out when you're with yeah, him? I was going to ask that, yeah. Oh, yes. <laughs> when we there with my family, I appear part from a child. Oh, yeah. <laughs> That's I what I, it. Yes. <laughs> I'm also a big fan of accents, having a mom who's Scottish. So I, I definitely uh, 
It, 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 I love hearing that because whenever she talks to her family, it always comes out too. Comes out. Like, yeah. yeah. Oh, that's great. Do they, what language do they speak besides English in Jamaica? It's Patois. It's just broken mm -hmm. English. Patois. It has mm -hmm. English and African words and um, some Scottish words because Scottish folks live there. Yeah. It's just a big meld of different influences in the language. Um, but it's, 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 it's a broken English. The, what the, brought you the, over? What, what was the, yeah, what was the <laughs> impetus for the move? My grandmother in her fifties decided to respond to, at that time, America, Canada, and England was bringing in skilled laborers from the Caribbean. And my grandmother in her fifties, having been like a widow for 14 years, decided to come and work in the US. And she was a she had she was a, a, a baker and a seamstress and she came over to, to work in healthcare. And then she brought over four of her her six kids and one of them was my mom. And we followed about five years after she came here. It's so fascinating when you think of your parents moving to a completely new country. That was definitely my situation. Kevin, yours too, right? Yeah, you know? both mine as yeah. well. Yeah. yeah. <clears throat> so, yeah, it's just fascinating because we don't have that experience. No. And she was in her 50s. Imagine yeah. changing yeah. a whole yeah. culture at that age. You know, when I reflect on it, I think that's really fascinating and she must have had to have so much strength and resilience to to do such a move by herself. So she did that and you were you were kind of eight, eight, seven or eight years old. And then I was eight yeah. and I was yeah. in the Caribbean still. And then yeah. my mom came up and then we waited for a year or two and then we came up. Mm. So it was it was interesting. You so, guys are getting stuff out of me that I've never talked about. It's your story. <laughs> yeah, this is kind of the, this is the job here. This is what we're supposed you to do. You guys are good. <laughs> I think one thing about immigrant children is we come to the United States and they have like boys and girls club and things that aren't like natural in other countries. Right. Um, did you feel like uh, you were kind of part of the same community? And, or was it kind of foreign to you? Did you feel like you were? Oh, yeah, I thought it was very foreign because I grew up in a smaller town, a more rural town, which is why I like cities that can give me that feel. Mm. And I came to New York, which is concrete everywhere. Jungle, and concrete the, jungle. Concrete jungle. And people would tease me and say, go back to your country, go back mm -hmm. to your, on your banana boat. And I'd get so upset and I'd say, but I flew on American Airlines. <laughs> 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 I wasn't on the banana boat. <laughs> oh, man. But no, I, I've always felt a little not a part of because mm. I'm from a different culture and mm -hmm. then grew up in this culture. And when I'm in Jamaica, they're like, you're American. When I'm an American, they're like, oh, you're Jamaican. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So yeah. It, you, you're kind of in this in-between space, which I think a lot of people recognize that space. And then being in healthcare where there's not a lot of you, you just have to always learn to assimilate and, and figure out how to get along with the people that you're around. So I went through your CV a little bit and, you know, you're so accomplished. You've been through so many different stages of education and different parts of the United States. Did your mom kind of look at you and say, like, push you forward and encourage you? Or was it very foreign to her that you were pursuing all these avenues? I was this kind of very independent child who knew what I wanted at a young age. And I I used to at eight want to be an astronomer. And then one day, and I do share this story, it's like I got a download that said, you're going to be a doctor. And then I just started saying, that's what I'm going to be. That is my path. And even if you look in all my yearbooks from elementary, it's like, congratulations on being a doctor. Like people just knew the, the, the knew. path I would well, take. I and, and did you know what a doctor is? Like, was it your pediatrician? Or did yeah, you have I, a, I don't know. I just you looked up to? to help people. I knew yeah. I wanted to make the world a better place. And that would be my contribution. And I just got buried into healthcare in every way that I could. In high school, I 
I was a, a, a nursing assistant in a nursing assistant program. I was in the hospital as many hours I, as I could be there. And then I did research in college at Thomas Jefferson. I was always engaged in it. And my family had almost nothing to do with it. They wow. would just cheer me on. That's amazing. I, I just had that vision and drive to, to, to have that dream. I remember being a kid and my mom trying to get me to do chores. And my grandmother would say, she's a professional woman. She doesn't do chores. I love it. <laughs> yes. yes. <laughs> my grandma's the Don't same. ask the professional woman to do. I mean, that, exactly. Like, who doesn't do chores? <laughs> Listen, Kevin, it's a big deal. When you have feminists in your family that, you know, can, can validate your want yeah. and need oh, yeah. to excel it's, it makes a big difference no it yeah does. And she was a strong matriarch so everyone yeah. listened to her so she so, was the yeah she was the one and did you all kind of live close by or together yes yeah, yeah we lived mm -hmm. close by not together but close by and when i was 15 i started to live with her because she started experiencing the end result of uncontrolled diabetes mm. and so i moved in with her and i lived with her through um Till college until she moved back to Jamaica. Interesting. And that, yeah, I'm sure she, you were helping then with the medical side of things at that. I would just go to appointments and listen yeah. and I'm thinking, how did it get to this? She's trying to follow the rules, but the doctors aren't really helping her. Like I saw that firsthand as a young mm. person mm. and I couldn't help her. Right. So I don't know why I didn't end up going into endocrinology because her story and my experience with her um was such a big deal for me but i i was um uh, susan mckinnon at washu fascinated me when she came to talk about surgery and then the course was set yeah i was gonna say what made you shift over into surgery yeah susan mckinnon she's a yeah. plastic surgeon and does yeah. um she's she's a big name in in um nerve reconstruction and a lot of other things and she came and gave my second year class a talk and i was like that's it and i thought i was going to do plastic surgery and i followed her and the plastic surgeons around during the summer and then when i when they when i saw an open belly and a liver i was like oh no this is it this is what i'm gonna do <laughs> I'm going to be is, an HPB surgeon. <laughs> little, little fun fact. I also had my little foray in thinking I was going to be a, a plastic surgeon. Really? I did. Yep. Yeah. And actually matched in a, well, and it was an unmatched, you know, out of the match spot. And I, and I had this like, come, come to Jesus moment. What do I do? You know? And, and I, I ultimately, I was, I was going to either be a plastic surgeon or go into general surgery. And, and I, I wow. obviously went into general surgery. So that's, uh, Wow. Very interesting. Yeah. You so see? share so much. Yeah. It's see, so funny. Yeah, you're like you're sharing. learning like, about Kevin too. Yeah, on exactly. yeah. <laughs> <clears throat> but so, I must say, uh, uh, K Marie dresses more like a plastic surgeon. And you yeah. Know, yeah. Yeah. Dress no, more no, like an no, HPV probably, surgeon. Probably. <laughs> I, I dress probably. more like a simple country surgeon. That, that's what I, I'll tell you. A simple country surgeon, you know, like, and but, then I had Nat Soper. He was a young attending at Washington. Oh, that's, yeah, that's right. And what he was one of my mentors. Oh, wow. and I would go and watch him do yeah. cholecystectomies, which were new. Yeah. And he was so good. And and he and Dr. Strasberg, they were all so influential in my journey at that time. And I remember Dr. Soper, I still tell him about it. He would play the wallflowers cd over and over i know all <laughs> those songs to heart that's cute <laughs> yeah we had a great what was, what's your favorite yeah. wallflower song from your medical school day? Oh, no. <laughs> oh my gosh i am not good with the titles but if you start singing one i'll start singing with you <laughs> what would be one headlight right isn't that be one, one headlight is a good yeah. one yeah was that was that the one did he do that for his closing you know so we didn't get this that. dirt on him during the sages stories uh podcast. We, we should have done him after oh, yeah. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so you could start playing some of that music <laughs> Because he's the reason why I went to MIS. Really? Mm -hmm. See, he's inspired yeah. a lot of us. So yeah. we will cross-reference his Sage's Stories uh, podcast uh, for yours, because I think that yes. you know, that's, that's fascinating. I, you know, I know you mentioned you're, you're, you were quite independent, but I'm sure that there were, there were some people who helped a lot. And who do you think helped the most in those early years, if you were to mm -hmm. kind of 
pin it down as someone who helped you the most and how, how did they impact you? I had a fifth grade teacher who just thought I was everything good, Mr. Gottesfeld. And he just helped boost my confidence in a way that was outstanding. And then my family is a big family. I have seven uncles and those seven uncles and aunt, I, they, I don't know, they just loved on me so hard. And I just grew up having such a level of confidence and they believed me when I said I was gonna be a doctor oh. and just always supported me in every way. And I, I was, you know, a little mini leader in my, in my sibling group, I kind of, kind of was a co-parent to them. I had to apologize when I reflected on it recently. I was like, I was like a little parent to you guys telling you what to do and how to be organized. And, you know, I, they didn't need me doing that. Did you, <laughs> did you ever reach out to your fifth grade teacher? See where he is right now? I did. I, did. I reached out to him oh. maybe like five years ago. And then I've had teachers along the way that they saw the story of when I became chair and some of them reached out. So, but he was one person who was just like, yes, you can be absolutely anything you want to be. Wow. And I always remember him. That's really cool. My brother's been doing that. He's been reaching out. He even reached out to his, uh, like kindergarten school teacher. Did they remember him? I don't think so, <laughs> but <laughs> he liked it. <laughs> <laughs> it's still an honor but you know it's many years ago and they still remember who you are and it's, it's incredible he went he he <laughs> true story he went and tracked down one of his um uh i think high, junior high or high school teachers and she's like i remember your sister but i don't remember you oh that's funny <laughs> what's she doing <laughs> she's like a healer now yeah. yeah but uh yeah exactly what is she doing um but <laughs> sorry it's just i think it's really cool to go to people that influenced you that had no clue they did yeah. and then spring that upon them because i think that's a nice story to share it is a nice story to be honored and have someone reflect on their life and say that you were a key person in your life yeah that's great as a medical school clerkship director i i start the rotation by asking students two questions. First, what excites you about the surgery rotation? And second, what makes you a little bit nervous? So given that you had those giants and some of that exposure, how, how would you have asked that? How would you have answered those questions? And then think about the medical students today. How, what are some things that they should be excited about and maybe a little nervous about? Yeah, I was just so happy to be where I was. You know, I had the opportunity to be at a medical school that was so nurturing and so supportive to medical students. Uh, WashU was absolutely incredible. And my, um, my uncle went to their dental school and the dean of the dental school was on my interview panel and he remembered my uncle fondly. So he always kind of took care of me while I was there. But when I went on to surgery, everything was magical about surgery, the anatomy, the patient's condition that you can impact so quickly, the ability to see them before, help them transition to a surgery, hold their hand throughout that uh, period of time, and then continue to connect with them after. It was such a rewarding experience. And I love that part of medicine, to be able to be a part of someone's life as they are vulnerable or hurting or struggling and then walk with them on that journey. There's nothing more powerful than that. And for medical students, I say, you know, you come to surgery, you don't have to love everything you rotate on, but get the most of it. What as an internist do I have to learn from a surgeon? What do I have to learn about the top three medical conditions that lead to a surgery and make connections and enhance your future career by really delving in and understanding all things surgery that may apply to you. So I don't I don't pressure them to love it. I pressure them to show up and be in the moment and enjoy the moment. That's really cool because at, at WashU, first of all, it's a huge campus like 
Yes. Over a thousand bed hospitals, something something enormous. Uh, it's a very surgically strong medical school. I think yeah. some medical schools kind of downplay surgery rotations, and it's it's not considered uh, something that they want. I did thirty six of... weeks of surgery. Oh, thirty six oh. weeks. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> Wow. I was almost an intern when I graduated. I was definitely an intern <laughs> when I graduated. Well, that our, makes ours a do difference. Six, ours do eight at case oh, yeah. five at Neoman. I mean, three months of general surgery. It was incredible. Wow. And then all the other specialties. It was incredible opportunity. It's incredible. It makes a difference. I, I don't know if you know Mark Cohen. He used to be at Michigan. He's the dean of UIC. He was in my class. And we were talking about that the other day, like how much surgery we did. <laughs> it's a surgeon. Is, it was tons of surgery. Four times as much as ours do now. Five times. That's amazing. Post and, then, and then you went to, to Pittsburgh. So how was that Pittsburgh. the same or different? Oh, I, you know, I always pick places where the people talk to me. And I went to Pittsburgh and it was like what you said, Kevin, like, oh, ah. it's like, this is where <laughs> I need to be. And I went on my interview and after Melina Kivy called and said, we want you here. Wow. And I was like, oh, that's so nice for her to call. And yeah. I share that story all the time because it's those little moments that make a big impact. Even 2023, I'm still talking about my interview at Pittsburgh and how Melina called and said, you know, we would like for you to be a part of the program. So I tell people, I tell our faculty and our residents, do this, do that for people you enjoy meeting when they interview. It's really important to feel like you can belong in a place, right? And even though I was the only black female there, the first black female there, I never felt like I didn't belong. I always felt like, and still do, like that's my surgical home. So um, that was another amazing experience. What were some of the highlights of the residency? Working with Dave Geller in his lab, learning I didn't want to be a basic science researcher. <laughs> it's always a highlight, figuring that yeah. out. That, that's <laughs> there, a good thing yeah. to figure out. You know, I'm not going to do this. I am I'm not, not going to do this. I am uh, not working on rats. I am. Right. Uh, yeah. Yeah. And then he had, you know, because of Strasbourg, I wanted to do HPB. And when I went to Pittsburgh and started working with Dave Geller and the transplant surgeons there, I was like, oh, I'm going to switch to transplant surgery. And then he switches to HBB surgery. And I said, oh, no, I'm not doing transplant. You don't even want to do transplant. Yeah, so. Exactly. <laughs> never looked back, I'm sure. I, never I, I find it fascinating that so many people go into transplant to not do transplant. It's not do transplant. They're like, why are you doing transplant? Oh, to eventually do liver resections. It's like, right. well, yeah. It's like, <laughs> sorry, I, I, we need to have a transplant surgeon on next time. I, I'm sure going to get and like. A, and a lot of people that. won't take a job if they can't do, you know, some HPB. Yeah. Yep. So it's, it's, it is, it is interesting. <laughs> it is interesting. Well, your pedigree only strengthened from there as if it wasn't strong enough. And you, you, you moved to Rochester for, for several years and 11 completed, years, 11 <laughs> years, a decade over a decade. Yeah. And you were, yeah. so you completed a clinical fellowship in GI surgery, you received a master's in science. So, you know, it's always great to have someone who spent that much time at, you know, at the Mayo Clinic it has obviously rich history, number one hospital in the country, many, many years running. I know it's maybe been surpassed here and there, but you know, hands down, number one. And it's always great to hear from someone who spent uh, an extended period of time there. So what was it like there? I'll tell you, um, the way I describe Mayo was that it's the utopia of medicine. Like, if there is a place where medicine and healthcare is delivered in the most ideal way that we can dream of, it's it's Mayo Clinic. And the principle of the patient comes first has resonated with me because that's what I thought was the most important thing going in. And that patient comes first model where if you call a tech at five o'clock and say, I need to give this patient a CT, their response is, absolutely bring it first because bring them down the patient comes first right there's never pushback towards patient care and i've tried to take that with me in the places i've been subsequently 
And that's one of my credos. The patient comes first and all my decision making is is centered around how does this impact the patient? How does this make their experience, their outcomes, their life better? So that's the magic of Mayo Clinic, that if it could be bottled and taken across the world, um, I think it would really do something powerful to healthcare. As a chairwoman right now in your department, how aspirational is it to get the hosp- your hospital to be like Mayo? Is it a leadership thing? Is it a financial thing? Like, um, is it a zip code issue? You know, um, can a chair of surgery just do that on their own? Do you need the entire hospital to buy into that kind of philosophy? You have to be that example you have to live that i say it's my credos i say it all the time i have a new transplant leader i brought the whole transplant team together and i reviewed the vision and i started with the patient comes first that level of messaging has to be consistent you got to train your students your you got to almost brainwash everybody that comes through with that message and say Do you align with this? Yes or no. When I'm hiring, that's what I want to see. People who are in alignment with that. And I'm at the seat at the highest tables. And that's how the conversation is driven from my point of view. And I could see people are adopting. People are taking it in because most people who work in healthcare really feels that inside. And sometimes it's stripped away or their focus is deviated because of different experiences, but we all went in to help patients and help people. So when you say that, the response is is, is usually to say, yes, I believe it and I'm gonna live it. Yeah, that's really great. I th- you know, I've been at multiple inst- institutions and we just got a new chairperson and actually a female. So we're super excited about um a having a new chairwoman, a chairperson, and also having our first ever female in our in our hospital. But I mean, the, immediately the message is new from from the top. It's so refreshing. Yes, and you have to hold people accountable when they're not behaving in that way. Like having accountability uh, and mm. and and making sure you're holding your fellow leaders accountable for their behavior is critical when you're trying to do culture sh- change. So I have tough conversations. I love having tough conversations um because it clears the air it and it creates alignment. So for those in the audience that may not be medical, Dr. King is an HPB surgeon, stands for hepatopancreatico biliary surgery. So after general surgery, I feel like the craziest, most complicated, highest risk operations that general surgeon does are all in the HPB world. Yes. Um, only second to hernias, right, Kevin? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> hey, exactly. those hernias can really be yeah. bad, right? Yeah. <laughs> That's what I yes. keep saying. <laughs> um, I remember doing those redo redos with Mike Sarr and oh yes, that Mayo, it's, yes. Yeah, they're they're complicated, not anything to scoff at. Um, yes, this is true. But I wonder, as an HPV surgeon, does that kind of, because you're kind of really in the trenches of uh, as a surgeon, as opposed to being more like a hands-off surgeon uh, leader, does that give you a little bit more weight to what you're doing as a chair? Do you have more insight into running a department because what you do is kind of, I don't want to call it like elite, but it's, you know, it's complex. It's complex. Yeah, Yeah. it's complex. Highly complex, right? And you have to break apart this problem and figure out a plan. And the plan is usually not the same for every surgery you do, right? Okay, the splenic vein is involved. How are you going to manage that? The portal vein is involved. How are you going to manage that? Um, the patient has a deep chest and you're, you're, you're buried down to you. It's always different and you have to think on your feet. So I think HPB was, first of all, I like complicated things and I like complex to try to fix a complex problem. And so I wanted to be in the mo- most complicated types of surgery I could be. 
and I don't like teeny tiny vascular anastomosis. So the yeah. heart was out. Cardiac was out. <laughs> uh, so I, and thoracic wasn't a, a track when I came through. If not, I probably would have heavily considered that. Mm -hmm. But I, I, I was so connected with the patients and the surgeries being so complicated and me having to solve them usually with a team of people. And then right. you have to get that team together right. with individual plans and and put together a comprehensive plan for the patient you do get some real leadership opportunity there as a surgeon having to bring radon med on um uh, nursing physical therapy dietary it's a lot of people on that team uh and and the more complicated the disease the more people around the table and you have to kind of lead lead that process and and to even make it more complex with with your pedigree and the era of your, your training laparoscopy and robotics yeah. obviously played a huge role um can you tell us a little bit about your journey into the field of minimally invasive surgery and what inspired you to combine the complexity of hpb with you know this additional tool that in many, many parts uh, of the world is, is probably not accessible to, to do that. It's, it's tough enough open. Oh yeah. Um, it was the time when Mike Kendrick was learning how to do lap uh, whipples. And I, I was hired after him a few years after him and I wanted to make my mark. So I said, I'm gonna learn how to do laparoscopic liver um, resections. And I, Mayo is really good about giving many sabbatical, sabbaticals for their faculty to learn new things. So I spent a month in France and a month in Japan with those surgeons learning how to do laparoscopic liver. And I came back and a, a young attending do dumb things. And my first case was a truth. That, that is truth. <laughs> it was a laparoscopic right hepatectomy. <laughs> I can say I've done a laparoscopic right hepatectomy as a young surgeon as well. And uh, yeah, <laughs> yes, yes. And then from there, I started teaching the team how to do it and then got enamored by robotic surgery mm. and started training um, to do robotic surgery and started doing a lot of robotic surgery. And that was the time that I, I left um, in 2016, but it opened my mind up to things that I didn't think I would even do as a graduate resident, right? Laparoscopic robotic liver surgery, um, laparoscopic pancreatic surgery, um, all things I didn't learn in training, but had to learn as a faculty. Uh, you know, uh, today we had a faculty meeting in my hospital and the residency program director mentioned that um, in our HPB department, our division, the residents are graduating with only laparoscopic and robot robotic liver and pancreas operations. They they graduate with zero open cases, which is definitely the flip of when I was a resident. So maybe since this is a kind of a Sage's sponsored uh, podcast, maybe ex share some insights as to how the technology transformed your career. That's a great question. You know, after I left and started at Grady, it allowed me, um, I was a chief of surgery at Grady before I came to Albany Med, and it allowed me to totally revamp that robotic program because I saw the benefits of it. And an integral part, I saw you had Shanita on, Shanita ran a robotic uh, training program and did so well so that every resident was graduating certified to work on the robot with a high volume of cases. And I've brought that experience to Albany Med. We've just did a whole revamp. Our residents are graduating fully robotic trained and you're right, they don't see a lot of, we have a young surgeon, um, Sandra DeBrito, that came from MD, MD Anderson that's doing a lot of robotic HPV. They're not seeing the open stuff anymore. It's a whole paradigm shift within our lifetimes where everything used to be stem to stern and now tiny incisions, robotic surgery. We just adopted the ION for thoracic and, and pulmonary and we're advancing care 
for patients quickly. I think that has been the impact on me is to see as a, you know, as a leader to understand at its core, the benefit of these sorts of tools for the surgeon and to push programming and opportunity for our surgeons um, in my department. And, and that's, I think that is fantastic and fascinating. I, I did see something in your CV as well that made my heart smile, which was uh, a talk you gave in Ghana on starting a laparoscopic uh, program in 2014. Did I tell uh, you? So expanding laparoscopy globally is, is a huge passion of mine. And so that was really great to see. So, and it also really reflects what's not happening in, in large parts of the world, which is this super subspecialization where we're able to offer minimally invasive surgery where people are graduating, not seeing an open pancreatectomy and you still have lack of laparoscopy in, in some countries and an entire continent, you know, 1 billion people. So what was that experience like and how are they, how are they currently doing? I know it's about a decade ago. So, this so is such a great story. Great. And I'm so glad you asked this. Okay. Why it took so long for me to come and talk to you guys? I don't know. <laughs> See, we're a hot, we're a hot group. <laughs> we had a liver hepatologist from West Africa at Mayo and he started going to give, um, lectures and education around hepatology. And then he invited the surgeons and I raised my hands that I wanted to go. And then I started to bring other surgeons and we introduced laparoscopy and Kumasi and, and um, Bingen or Casey came with us. She was a part of that program. She's a part of Sages. And we brought laparoscopy so that one of the new young surgeons could learn it. And they did their, we did our first laparoscopic cholecystectomy during that visit. Amazing. And he came back and forth, learned, and then developed a big program of laparoscopy um, in Ghana. And it can be done. And you need just interested parties and interested people. I mean, I used to teach ATLS. Uh, we did... I remember we couldn't get CO2 medical grade. So we would just, we just use like carbon uh, CO2 from some industrial CO2 to get started on that case. We were putting things together, thinking through how to make it work because we didn't have all the fancy tools wow. here in the United States. In, in Gabon, they just use room air. They don't even look for CO2. Really? Whoa. And and nobody has exploded. Uh, so it's they use room air. They filter room air and an, an endoscopic uh, in, insufflator. That's awesome. Yeah. Well, and you know the fancy um, air seal that we use also puts in room air in addition. Yeah, oh, I didn't know that. So I didn't know that. Okay. As long as it's less than twenty one percent or oxygen. up to twenty one percent oxygen, oxygen, yeah, it not be a flammable risk. But yeah, that's I, so. Have what kind of follow up do you have with with that group? And and well, we, we help them to publish. So oh, the that's great. Is published, and I I had friends in Accra, and I reached out to them to see if he was still in Kumasi, and he's moved on to another university, but they're still doing laparoscopic surgery. That's amazing. I love that story. Yeah, it's a great and, story. And do you have plans to go back? I want I mean, to. I'm very busy. I, I don't expect you to say yes. <laughs> <laughs> you have a few things on your plate. Yeah, you have a few things so on your plate. Do the same work in um, Jamaica and um, and uh, Barbados, and Jamaica just asked me to be their external examiner. It's a it's a thing, but I'm their oral ex um, external and written oh, okay. external examiner that monitors the process. And we just had a conversation about how we can help train some of their graduates to bring more advanced um, robotic and MIS to the Caribbean. And it would be in Jamaica if that's if 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 we could do that. So we just had our first conversations with my, some of my program leaders to see how we can allow for training and then an exchange of um, residents and medical students to both both sites. That's really amazing. Um, 
Well, one of the main reasons why I wanted you here is because I was present at the SAGES 2022 meeting when you gave your Gerald Marks lecture. I was one of the many in the back that were crying. I was too. I was, I was literally crying and I don't wear um, waterproof mascara, so it wasn't a pretty sight. <laughs> Uh, <laughs> well, you know I was crying. <laughs> yes, you were. That was water. You just spilled more. water. That was just <laughs> and I water. spilled water. <laughs> <laughs> I was spilling the water to do this. <laughs> uh, we'll definitely make sure there's a link of that because it's on YouTube and we, you can watch it. Very, very moving. Well, is it on YouTube? Yeah. I, yeah. I didn't know that. Okay. It'll be shared on the link uh, when we drop this. But yeah, it's on. It's on the Sages TV uh, uh, site. So yeah, I've shared it with many of my friends that weren't at the meeting. It was just an amazing lecture. It really was. Um, I felt at that so time connected with the audience, yeah. and the audience was so connected and supportive of me. It was a real magical moment. It was a packed room. We're all there to support you. Yeah, yeah. it was a magical moment, and to be asked to do that, what an honor! Yeah. I kept calling her and saying, why? Why do you want me to do this? <laughs> I, must have, I must have said it like three or four times. I was like, no, nah, I don't think you want me. You want Aww. some other person. And she mm. kept saying, no, I want you. <laughs> I think we even discussed it with Jerry. Didn't we, yeah, Kevin? We did. No, I think we, I think we, brought, we brought it up. It up. Yeah. He, 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 he didn't make it, uh, obviously, but he's He's been trying to keep up with the lectures when they happen. So he's too busy painting. His he's son busy was painting. There. His, His son, son was, was there. Yeah. There. yeah. And he approached me and he was in tears and he was saying what an honor it was. Yeah. In fact, we talked at the last meeting as well um, and that he shared it with his dad. So that was nice for him to do that and to, to follow up with me in that. But it's quite, quite an experience. So at that time, you had just been announced as chair, first black female chair. Um, yeah, I. What? Was, what so was about that? six. It was about six months prior, I think, that you were appointed. Yes, right? I yeah. was. I was just appointed, um, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm, and new and and very new in role. I and we've been like trying to get role. you as a guest ever since, but it's been a whirlwind since yeah. then. So maybe tell us a little bit about what you've been doing. <laughs> As chair. Oh As chair. Um, I have an amazing group of people that I work with and AMC, I elected to go to AMC over other institutions because of the people. They're earnest, kind, they're everything that I um, live by, uh, um, the, the credos that I live by. And so I have a vision of revamping research quality and education, and it's a big vision and a vision based on the book, Good to Great. I have it in my office. I gave it to all my faculty. Dr. Stain did an amazing job in building a department from 15 people. And when I acquired it, I think it was 150 people. Every single division except neurosurgery was in the department. Now ENT, ortho, and urology are their own department, but I'm the chief of surgery, so still get to work with them. And so I wanted to build on what he did. It's a, a tremendous growth. We're the only academic center in the Northeast. We pull from Canada to Westchester to Vermont and so clinically busy. So number one trauma center, number one vascular center in the country, just ranked uh, US News Report and revamping them to even go higher and bigger. AMC, the people there are very quiet and they don't brag. So I wanna brag about how terrific they are and how wonderful they are. And I get to work with these people every day. I go to work so happy every day and I don't deal with personnel issues. Um, and so it's all been about how to grow and improve and 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 improve the opportunities for our patients and develop our faculty and students and trainees you know, you know albany really is a very unique place uh i know steve stain because i worked at usc as my first job yeah I introduced to him through usc where he got his hepatobiliary training 
and always had like a very close link with everyone there. Um, and I'm like, what a fascinating guy, but he's in Albany. Um, it's kind of way out there, right? And then you learn about the beautiful department. place I've ever yeah. lived in. It's such and, a secret and a gem. Wow. And his medical students also, he had a whole thing about um, extra attention to the medical school, which is really nice to see from a chair of surgery. He did. Um, he met with them every week. And I, I have taken on that same responsibility, except I share it now with some of my other um, House of Surgery chairs. So they get broad exposure. But he met with them every single week and was really committed to the students. But what a great program to apply to, to go to for medical school and surgical training. I mean, oh, yes. anyone who is watching this, it's yeah. one of those gems that, you know, I always recommend to my Ooh, and we yes. have some really fantastic students this year. They are incredible. Yeah. So, um, I'd like to. And as the new chair, here. we were discussing this earlier. So besides you personally being very, very fashionable, um, <laughs> tell us about your office. I can't believe you have such a, I want to come oh with you just to. I like, wish I could show you my hospital. office. Yeah. It's white carpets. My, my. I have a six seat um, table in my office with white chairs. And that table I got from Justin Dimmick. I went to his office oh, and I said, I have, nice. to, I have to get that. I have a golden white marble wall. Oh, and I need office, an, we're gonna do office, the next one's in person. We're next yes, to interview is and in my person. office For furniture sure. is black. So everything is sleek and oh, modern nice. and it's all windows all around. It's beautiful. And I love all you. with a view. You have a view. I have views of the Adirondack Mountains wow. and trees as far as you could see. It's it's just simply beautiful. Lots of glass around you. Lots of glass. And I love going to work because my office is so like zen. Well, speaking of glass, uh, one of the and I'll let people listen to your entire talk, but I think very in interesting uh concept that you brought up is this concept of a glass cliff um and on the one hand it was super disheartening uh mm -hmm. but on the other hand it was really interesting to be introduced to that uh and so i i think it's be nice for our listeners to maybe hear a little bit about that concept because I, I think you shared it very well very you articulated it well but um love to hear a little more about it yeah, there's a, some research that has been done looking at CEOs and other leaders in business that once they break the glass ceiling, they end up in isolation on a, on a glass cliff. And the research, the data shows that 63% of, of people will say a woman should be a leader in time of a crisis. But it's also a risky time, right? Because everyone is tense, stressed, and some may not recognize or want to acknowledge that woman as a leader. And so more than half may be fired after doing that job. So for me, when I, when I went in, I asked my Dean that was hiring me, I said, are you ready to have a black female chair? He was like, what? <laughs> are you serious? I said, yes, are you ready? Because there may be people who don't wanna recognize me for my skin color or my gender. And so you have to support me in a way that will allow my leadership to flourish. And I, and I said the same thing to the CEO, and they have. I am the clear leader of the House of Surgery. There's no question about it. I have such excellent support, and there's nothing I don't ask for that the dean doesn't make happen if I can't make it happen by myself. And so that's what... And I talk openly about this with my male um, division chiefs and, and I talk openly period about it that I need you to be in alignment with me for this vision to happen. Do I have your partnership? And it's a yes, okay, then we can move forward together. But it's a scary space and we need to acknowledge it and women need to know how to navigate it. That's really, that's really great. Cause you're very direct about it. And yet everyone was like, oh yeah, we need to, we need to like, therefore address it. Yes. Yeah. Um, we had a big financial crisis and I was tasked to lead the financial mitigation plan and for Periop. And 
when I spoke to the CEO, I said, I need you to make sure at any time you have the opportunity to endorse my leadership. Because some people will go around leaders, right? To their, to the people above them. And I needed to say less. Like the next conversation, he said, you're using the hierarchy publicly. You use the hierarchy, you respect the hierarchy, and you cannot come to me directly with complaints. And that set the tone. So you're, 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 the leaders have to support you publicly and privately. Right. They can't do things that undermine your leadership. And as women, we're at risk for yeah. that kind of undermining. And so to be clear, did you have that discussion before you accepted the chair? How do you, yes. how does one know if you're if you're the people that you need to rely on will support you? You gotta ask. Okay. You have to ask and make sure they can commit to you. Right? Mm -hmm. You don't assume it. That's why I ask, are you ready for this? This this is what may come with it. Are you prepared? I think anyone getting a job should ask and make sure that their leaders are committed to them, right? Because some people hire people they don't believe in because it fits some, you know, it checks a box or they may hire because they're pressured for a need. And so I don't hire like that. I hire people who I'm passionate about, they're passionate about me. And- You're filling the bus. Yeah, man, we we're going this way together, right? Good to great. Uh, good to great. More than good to great. But you have to ask. Yeah. Do I have your support? I've seen people write letters of recommendations for people who are so horrible and tears them down, and that individual don't even know it. And I'll call them and said, "Stop getting letters of recommendation from this person." Oh. Do not get another letter from this person because they're not your friend and they're not being honest. If you can't endorse someone, you should say that. I'm sorry, I can't endorse you for reasons A, B, and C. And if you don't give them that gift of feedback, you're holding back from their own personal growth. And you want people to grow. Not everyone is perfect. You want them to have that opportunity to grow. So you ask, you make sure that they believe in you as you believe in yourself. Wow. This is why you need to listen to the Gerald Marx lecture. This is exactly it. Yeah. So moving. When are you going to write your book? <laughs> I'll read your book. The Good to Great Volume 2 by Dr. K. Marie King. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I have about six or seven books inside of me that I do want to write. Yeah. Um, and... It's just a matter of time and getting someone to work or partner with me to write it. But I do have a lot to say, and I've invested so much in my own personal development that I'm left with a so much higher EQ than I had when I started this journey. And that takes intentional work, um, really intentional work uh, to grow like this as a leader and as a person. I mean, you're... Um... What you just need is someone who's a good writer that can follow you around and everything yeah. you're saying, they can just kind of translate that into a book. Yeah. If you were in LA, you would have your old reality show. Oh my God. <laughs> That's no, for I would sure. watch it. Yeah. <laughs> I'm too busy. I'm too yeah. We don't read books here. No, no, but yeah, we watch they, TV. <laughs> they, they, you wouldn't, they would just follow you. On See, Hulu. You wouldn't, you, you wouldn't even have to, you wouldn't even have to do anything. They'd just have a camera in your face and they'd be, <laughs> yeah. they'd be calling you along. And there's everyone's on strike now, so they definitely need. That's right. They need off. something to do. <laughs> so they're, they're, they they need to follow someone. They, we would be the scabs. We're I know. We'd effectively be yeah, the scabs. I feel bad for the writers, and I hope that um, they're able to get the 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 demands met that they're asking for because they're so valuable, and yeah. um, we need to be able to have them live good lives because they're the main contributors. Yeah. and getting paid so well on a more serious note though it's everything you're saying is so inspirational it makes sense that you've championed in dei right diversity equity and inclusion um you found the task force for the surgical society of the elementary track ssat which i used to be used to belong to um so we've ex asked some of our guests to comment not only on the ongoing challenges but also some of the wins in that space so where do you think we are in 2023? Because if you follow Twitter, which I do, 
it can be very disheartening. So much negativity about all the you are making on, the, on uh, a tough spot. I don't know if yeah. I can be as honest as I want to be in this space. I mean, no one really listens to this podcast anyway, so say whatever yeah, you want. So I'll just say what I want. <laughs> <laughs> Stuff in Fiji. <laughs> the Fijians and the Mongolians will will definitely write in. That is for sure. Here's where I have landed, having um, done work in DEI when at Mayo at in in societies and. I've almost stripped myself from saying the term because it's become almost like a cliche term, totally divorced of the underlying intention of what that work is like. And I've moved instead to say, create spaces and experiences of belonging where people can feel like they belong. Because if you're doing that, it doesn't really matter where you're from, what your gender is, um, what language you speak, if you have a disability, you're creating spaces for people to belong to. And so I think like, okay, if someone has difficulty walking, can they get into the operating room? How are we managing when our patients don't know English and we put them in a pre-op space with no translators. Can you imagine how nervous and fearful and scared they are? So when I was at, May, at Grady as chief of surgery, we started bringing the interpreters all the way into the operating room. So if you are empathetic and sympathetic oh. and you think about creating spaces for people to feel like they belong, suddenly, you're acting in a whole different way that's not about um, quotas or filling a checkbox or saying that, yeah, we believe in this, but when people come into your space, they can't thrive. They can't thrive. So I see a lot of people talking about the DEI work they're doing. They're building their careers. They're publishing, but I don't see the output. We still have horrible numbers of underrepresented minorities. And then when they come into our spaces, we treat them so bad that they can't thrive and they're falling out of the pipeline. So I have a lot to say yeah. about that. I almost don't want to hear the term because it's not being used in a way that really respects and honor the reasons why we actually need to focus in that space. You're so right. Absolutely. Yeah. We probably could have a whole podcast on that to unpack <laughs> That's your, a whole your other thing. <laughs> yeah, your your thoughts. And I, I appreciate and we appreciate your honesty to not just sort of uh pat it on the back and say, you know, like we're making you know, I, I, I agree. I think that you see up and down yeah. trends that, that are worrisome in in the, some of the demographics of medical school and graduates and you know, in surgery, of course, is, is, you know, this high, high, you know, high stress environments that tend to, you know, lead to a lot of burnout. And so I, you know, we will, we'll leave it there, I think for now, uh, maybe, <laughs> in, yeah. Um, but I think we also being the Sages uh, podcast, we got a little bit of a glimpse into your introduction as, into Sages and you've been active in many many committees and leader leader and many of those. Um, but I was hoping you could expand on that a little bit for the podcast. I think it's always great to hear the story of how someone was introduced so to Sages and, and got, got involved. My first Sages meeting was as a third year residence, resident in medical school. And I went to this meeting just fascinated by what people were doing and talking about and how they were applying all this new technology. And I continued into residency, joining Giselle Hamad. She used to be so active in, in Sages. She's not so active now. She's a bariatric surgeon. And then I really got into the leadership side when Dan Jones, who I, I worked with a lot in SSAT, he said, you need to be a part of Sages. Sages needs you, they need your voice, and I'm nominating you to be a part of the advocacy committee. And I chaired that with Ross, 
who he's your current um um podcast yeah <laughs> yes ross goldberg and i shared that for some years and then i said i think somebody else needs to do this and then i got um the opportunity to be the co-chair of the program committee because of some of the other work that i've done with the hbb committee and the safe coley committee uh, so it's been wonderful getting connected in sages and keeping connected even though I'm not on the forefront of the surgical side anymore. I get to make the decisions to advance technology in my department and SAGES is, is therefore a very important part of my of membership uh, of, a, of a society to have and belong to during this kind of uh, transition into leadership. You mentioned Giselle Hamad. She's actually working at NeoMed now, which- uh, You really? Mention. Yeah, so I work with her with the NeoMed students. I've, uh, so it's fun to hear, hear you drop her name. So she, I've met her and uh, she's working with the clerkship students uh, who come through at Metro Health where I am. I want to and... give a shout out to Giselle. She yeah. is Aida Cromadon and yeah. I would hang out and say, we're going to start this new multicultural clinic. We would have all these dreams. Yeah. And um, that's amazing. Please tell yeah. her I said hello. I will. I will. Absolutely. And, you know, following up on that great story, uh, we have our favorite segment, which we call the We Are the Sages segment. We are the sages. Sing it, everybody. We are the ones who make you bright our day. So let's start dreaming. Have you had a good time tonight? And in this segment, we would love to hear your favorite Sage's moment. I have a, a hunch Ooh. of what that's going to be, but uh, we, you know, we we always learn something new when we when we throw this question out. When I was a fellow, I came to Sage's. Um, they would have all the 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 GI fellows come and do the Covidian course and. I think it aligned with the sages meeting at that time it's some time ago and you know the last night where you sing in what's it called again i the missed sing -off. that the, the sing off the sing off the sing off yeah sing off um <laughs> we're gonna have a flat we're gonna have a flats off and a sing off it's, we're gonna have a flats off and a sing off and i'm all <laughs> about the karaoke my husband and i yeah. used to do karaoke every single friday night and um i don't colorectal colorectal surgery leader blonde very fashionable oh what's her name from mayo scottsdale yeah yes she was a part of it and we all oh, got yes. in costume and went on stage and sang abba that's my favorite sage's story oh that's a great I one remember okay. that i remember that do you remember that i do remember that Sharon has the memory. She has a fantastic I have never memory. missed this. That's like 2005. Yeah. Like 2005, 2006. Right. We yeah. had Sharon a would remember. ball. We had a ball and we sang ABBA. It was well, great. Well, you weren't even born yet, Kevin, so you don't really count. <laughs> <laughs> I'm Doogie Hauser. <laughs> uh, that is my favorite sage's story <laughs> that's awesome i love it that's a good one hey that's kevin what one. did you think it was going to be well i thought your gerald marks moment was was probably your, epic. your you know that was but i thought you were talking about something fun no that i think it's good to have multiple good but that but you're but that's what i mean i think we ask it and we we let people let people uh say the first thing that comes to their mind. And and oftentimes it is it is actually a fun thing. And I, I yeah. think that speaks to to sages, you know, uh that most people come up with some fun thing. I mean we've heard some definitely some scandalous uh answers to that uh, oh, yeah. question. Scandalous. Yeah. Oh, oh yeah. yeah. Oh yeah. Uh was it so, episode three, four, something yeah, like that? One of those one of the early, early episodes. Ones. I'm gonna, yeah. I'm gonna go yeah. back and listen to that one. <laughs> we'll send it to you. <laughs> yeah, we'll send it to me. I want to hear that scandalous oh, answer. Man. I'm like uh can we publish this? I don't know. All right. <laughs> So bad. You have to uh, get and I, I assured, and she's like, "Yep, no, we're definitely publishing." I said, "Okay, okay." I, 
publishing it. Uh, I need to be a co-host with you guys from time to time. This oh, is, you know? that would be awesome. <laughs> I don't want to lose my job, but you know, know. you're, you're welcome lose, to join we'd us. Lose it, we'd lose it's it in a heartbeat great. if you took over, that's for sure. <laughs> this is crazy. I'm having fun. My husband's probably like, what is she doing? What is she doing? <laughs> Another one of those surgery podcasts. <laughs> <laughs> We're talking about the pancreas. So how We're going to break the here? internet. <laughs> So who would you recommend we also interview? I know Dan Jones is definitely on our list. Um, oh, definitely. Who else should we interview, you think? Have to do Dan Jones. Um, that's a great question. My, I was going to say Dan Jones. You haven't had him on. He's We haven't had him on yet, but he's, no, he's on, on the list. list. He's on the he, list. He's, he's passionate. He loves yeah. sages. Um, he constantly recruits for sages. And I opened the chapter, funny. so let me turn in the chapter first, and then we can interview him. <laughs> oh, yeah. No, he asked me to participate. I just couldn't. I My plate has been so full, so um, and I had to learn how to say no when you don't want to say no, especially to things like this. You don't want to say no, but you yeah. only have 24 hours to a day. Yes, that is true, and you have given us a good chunk of today's uh and we're yeah. extremely blessed uh and like we said in the beginning we love this we love to get to meet people your story has inspired us uh many in sages and now that's going to extend to some of my neighbors uh some of my patients who listen uh obviously our our followings in various countries so our vast followings. Our vast following. So thank you <laughs> so much. For and think of all the your... calories we just burnt in an hour. I laugh so laughing. Laughing. I know, laughing. You got exactly. a lot of endorphins. That's right. Thank so, you guys. It's really a privilege to be here with you. And you really dug deep. You guys are like investigative reporters. Oh yeah. Um running this show. But the thank you so much. But but now people are gonna know just a touch more about. You know, Dr. K. Marie King and what makes her tick. Oh, and thank you. so that that's our job, you know, and I, I think we I think you you really you hit it out of the park. Where so, the K you. comes from, it's not a Kardashian. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Kevin and I could become Kevin Kardashian and Kevin Kim Kardashian. Kardashian. K. Marie, yes. Could adopt exactly. Yes. Well, All thanks right. so much. You guys have the great rest of your summer and enjoy your night. Thank you so much. Bye. And that wraps up today's episode of Sage's Stories. You can view the show notes for any links to sites we referenced today. Visit sages.org for membership information and for the most recent news from our society. Follow us on Twitter at sages underscore updates. Make sure you hit the like button and subscribe so you don't miss any future episodes. See you again next time, and remember, you can't spell minimally invasive surgery without sages.